girl from a supermodel. Anywhere me go, me set the trend. Them we are just feel, but feel no feel no deal. Yeah. Bounce back. In the wake of his continued dominance of dancehall, even from behind bar, Vibes Cartel's enablers are generally very vocal in claiming their contributions to the DJ's exponential rise. You introduce me to Cartel and Butler to the upper echelon of the space. Yet very few people notice perhaps Cartel's most consequential enabler. You have a manager when a player, the man determined of Butler. Ron Butler, who sits before us right now in Atlanta, Georgia, to tell his side of this explosive rise of a dancehall artist known as Vibes Cartel in Jamaica. Honestly, I could not control him. But before he breaks his silence on Cartel for the first time in over 15 years, Guinness top 10 trending songs in Jamaica this week. Love Experience by Jada Kingdom and TJ starts off for Countdown at number 10. We Okay says Ritical at number 9. Governor holds steady on our countdown at number eight with Chop Chop. Chronic Law comes through with the Talk You Talk medley featuring Quada and Mad Dog Six at number seven. While Alkaline has the medicine at number six. Starting off our top five, it's a squash with Richard Millie. Chanel Muir is exclusive at number four. I don't watch the group, my no my girl, my got a lot of flow, them sick. Stock a lot of shows, I'm gonna make a lot of it. Chronic Law makes his second appearance on this week's countdown with No Tell Me Nothing at number three. And Intense with the Yahoo Boys is number two. Mark X with the crown and a silver plate. Big photo jack dog, man could celebrate. Costa Rica is Panyol client. Shooting to the number one spot of this week on our Guinness trending countdown. No surprise here, it's Shansia with Run Run. I know you'll make me happy. Run, run, run. Run, run, run. run. After the break, Ron Butler, Vibes Cartel's first manager, breaks his silence for the first time in 16 years. What credit do you take for setting him up to become the cartel that we now know? So I start, I tell you, even though I talk now, I feel it. On stage with Winford Williams, so much more than entertainment. Rowan, sir. Yes, sir. Thanks for coming and sitting before us, sir. So could you start with um, who you were before Vibes Cartel? I was born in Kingston. To be exact, the Kiwanis Clinic in Tivoli Gardens. Oh. My mom and my dad were living on um, 9th Street, Greenwich Farm. After that, they moved to Portmore, Waterford, in 1976. So I've been living in Portmore since Marlemont Primary, Independent City, all age. Then um, I went to St. Catherine I. After leaving St. Catherine I went to Durham College. I did a, um, business accounting. At that time, I still didn't know what I really okay. wanted to do. But I know I had a passion for music because during my late teenage life to my mid 20s I used to keep parties um, we call it roadside party in Jamaica yes during that time I met lecturer mm -hmm. so I started managing him okay. the one that would put the mop on his head and wear the water boots and all kind of but his, his thing is more gimmicks that's how I got into the music um, 
where artist is concerned. So the passion drove you to management? Right. I also used to manage Brock of the Dancer. So but at that time, what experience did you have in managing No experience. Artists? Okay. I just, I just love it and I just use my creativity. You know, I just know that there's something going on over there and I find who the promoter is and I just go to him and say, listen, man, this is my artist, you know, and he's this talented, I need a break with him. I'm not looking at the money. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the fact that they hear that you're not looking at the money, they would give you a, a chance. So I used to go out by um, Goodyear in St. Thomas where Mr. Lee, Lee's Unlimited, used to play out there every Tuesday night. So I used to carry um, lecture out there, you know, until I get him on Sting and it started happening until they, they left and went overseas. So... They left you alone? Yes, they, they, they got their, their work permit, so they went overseas and they did their thing. So you're out of the job then? Well, not really, no, because I've always had a nine to five. Yes. No, that's one thing that I always had, a nine to five job, regardless that I'm doing the music. Because okay. I used to work at um, Jamaica National Building Society. Mm -hmm. I used to work at um, Church's Credit Union. I used to work at Cable and Wireless Credit Union. Then I went to T get his grant. Oh. Then I went to DHL as a courier. And then that's when now I met Cartel while working at DHL. Mm. But before that now, I'm the one who introduced the big screen in the dance hall in Jamaica. So um, Jack Sower used to hook up his um, video camera to the big screen. So people know wherever you are in the dance, you can see what's going on, even if it's around the corner. Because if the cameraman is around the corner, it's showing on the screen, and the screen is always elevated, so you can see what's taking place. So that used to take the dance hall. So that also helped me you know, to meet more and more promoters out there. Because the screen is mine, and I went to them, and you know. So you were now cemented in the, in the music right. space. And but, during that, I was, it gave me the opportunity to meet a lot of artists in the business. Okay. So I started meeting dance hall acts way before I even met Cartel. So you came to the space with business credentials, vast experience in working for corporate Jamaica, okay? And you had been dabbling in, you had a passion, and had been dabbling in management of artists in your early years, but it, it was always coinciding with your job in corporate, right? Yes, sir. Okay, so that, that sets you up now to be in leadership, management. So what was it about Cartel that, that drew you to him? Or was it he who found you? No, well, interestingly, you know, <laughs> back in the days in the 90s, early 90s, we used to have the, the cable company just got introduced mm -hmm. to um, Portmore. So we had a channel called Channel 33. Yes. And, and the cable company where all the show is videos of parties that happened previously, you know? So I was watching it one day while I was a woman. There was a stage show in, in, in Gregory Park and Cartel was performing. But the context of his lyrics when I heard it, I was like, this, this, this is no normal person. I've never heard a DJ spitting lyrics like this before in all my years. And I was a Beanie Man fan. I was a Bounty Killer fan. Mm -hmm. I was a Papa San fan. And Papa San to me was the greatest lyricist of the, at, the, at that time. Mm -hmm. So some things that Cartel was saying, I was like, this is not normal, but I never know him. Didn't know where he lived, didn't know nothing about him. Although I was living in Waterford and he was in Waterford. Never met him before. Okay. So there's this guy that used to record um, the parties, video, the parties. Um, White Lock. Mm -hmm. So I said, listen to me, man. This guy, I need to know him. So White Lock said, yeah, man, I know him, man. I said, all right, let him know that I need to talk to him. So it was like a couple of days after... White Lock came to me and said, you know, I got in touch, touch with him and he's going to come see you. So I had a party coming up in Waterford and when Cartel came to see me, he came, it was, it was three of them. 
Because a lot of people don't know that Vibes Cartel was a crew. Mm -hmm. The crew was called Vibes Cartel. So he was Adibantan. Then you had Mr. Lee. And then you had Escobar as a singer. So it was two DJs and one singer. And that, of course, explains the, the name, the, the word cartel in his name. Right, exactly. Cartel, Car cartel is a group. Cartel was a group. Right, exactly. Yes. It was a group. So they came and I said, listen, I'm having a party. The party was with Mansa Shock Crew and Jack Yor. Mm -hmm. That was before Jack Yor went on his vacation. <clears throat> I was doing that party with um, a friend of mine called Three Stripes. We invited car, uh, the crew and they came. They performed. Like two, three days after the party, they came back and saw me and I said, do you have a manager? They said, no, not really, you know. I said, would you like me to be a manager? But little did I know, they knew about me okay. because of all the parties that I did mm -hmm. and the big screen, that was a big thing for them because when I keep my party and I put up the big screen in Waterford, everybody talk about it. So that made me popular in Waterford. So he gave me that opportunity, being that he was the leader of the group, to say, yes, be the manager. So from there on, <clears throat> what I used to do is, I used to drive around and if I see, cause you know in Jamaica, you put the, the, the posters on the light post. Yes. So if I see a posters on the lineup look good and I figure that this is a, gonna be a good show, I would find the, the promoter, you know, and talk to them about putting them on. Mm -hmm. So that's how we started campaigning, you know, to try to break him out. But I got them on Champion in Action. This was before Louise Bennett died. And Louise said, uh, they're going to perform at 5 o'clock. But in my head, I was like, 5 o'clock? That's too early. Nobody's not going to see them. So in a way, I said, listen, I'm going to meet my house at 3. 3 o'clock on the dot, Adibantan, who is now Vibes Cartel, was at my gate. Mm -hmm. 4 o'clock, Mr. Lee turned up. 5 o'clock, no Escobar. <laughs> so we decided that, okay, we're going to drive to his house. So the three of us got in the car, we drive to his house. When we went there, he was sitting on the veranda with two girls braiding his ear at 5 o'clock. And I'm like, oh, me tell you, say you're going to work at 5. At 5, you're still doing your hair? So I said, okay. So now I start thinking like, me can't deal with them idiot here, you know, mm -hmm. among other idiot before. So that's when I decided that this is it for me. I'm going to leave these guys alone you know, because they're not serious. So when I got to the show, I said, you know what? Cartel have the real talent. So I said to him, I'm going to put you up there first. Let you perform. So you're going to perform two songs by yourself and then you call them up to do the, the song that you're known with them for. So it went that way. He performed, went well. When they came off stage, um, Jack Scarpio mm -hmm. and King Jams were standing side by side. But because I met them during my runnings, they called me over and they said, you see the tall black one? And bad. And I said, I know, man, that's what I'm going to do what I did. Because mm. I wanted to showcase and let people know where the talent really is. Two legends. All right. Called me in and spoke about him right there. Oh, yeah. So I said, yes, that's good. You understand? So, after the show, I told him, I said, listen now. You're fired. I'm done. <laughs> no, I told him, I said, I'm done. You fired them or you said... You, no, everybody, group, everybody, group. everybody, whole group. I said, I'm okay. done. How did Ron become Adibantan's manager after firing the entire cartel? The answer, after the break and still to come. A lot of people don't know that Vice Cartel's true strength is war. You know, I think Bunty should do this song. So what do you mean by that? I wasn't in the fight, but they came at me to take away my license firearm. Actually, after sting that same morning, I went to Ninja Man's hotel room. What credit do you take for setting him up to become the cartel that we now know? From the start, I tell you, even though I may thought, no, I may feel it. Vibes cartel! It's Vibes cartel time now. I just walk away. And then when he sang the song, Shut Go Jail, I think they took offense to that song too. From there, I think that's when they were like after him.
Dream Weekend New York, August 27 to 29. For tickets and info, visit dreamwknd.com. And now, Rowan answers the question How did he become Adi Banton's manager after firing his cartel? About two days after that cartel come back to my house, and he said, Listen, you know, I can't carry them from my back go half a tree from Portmore, you know. So I still want you to be my manager, you know, because now Carter see me getting from champion in action. And him know say, this never happened for him before. Mm -hmm. So when he said that, I said, okay, no problem. So he fired them? No, I guess he just made a decision and spoke because, I mean, he was the one writing all the lyrics. All they had to do is just rehearse mm -hmm. for the show. And he was upset also. Because for him to be... About the behavior? Yes, yeah, for him to okay. be the... the the, the, the more dominant one then of the group. Mm -hmm. And he was at my house at three o'clock. Yes. And they didn't turn up until when they felt like it. It's like to him, they weren't serious. You understand? So he said, listen, I don't, I don't care about them. But I didn't really want it to go like that. So I said, you're sure? He said, yes, because Mr. Lee at the time to me was the one with the better vocal he could have his clarity and everything was and his voice was strong so i, I would rather have them as a group yeah but when cartel said that now i said all right we're gonna take on the road together and then i had met bounty killer from 1998 when i was having a party and he did the commercial for me yes to promote the party and then that is why, oh, when I gave him the big screen for Saga to the East in 1999. I'm waiting for that. Yes. And I said to him, I have an artist, you know, that I want to perform. But I want him to perform when you are performing. And he was like, you can't guarantee me that. Because then he never meet cartel yet. They don't know nothing about cartel. But me, I convinced him, said, no, man, the youth are bad. It's so happened that... Cartel was slotted to work much earlier than Killer. So after Saga to the East, I guess Killer watched the tape. Because when I went to the car wash to see Killer, I said, Now I know why you tell me to call up this dude when I was working. Him bad man. Anyways, I used to give Cartel ideas like topics and songs that he should write. Sometimes he does it, sometimes he doesn't. Sometimes he would call me in the morning and say, listen to this song. And if I say I don't like it, I remember one time he wrote a song and I said I didn't like it. And he said, what do you mean why you don't like it? And I said, I just, I just don't like it. Go, go work on it some more, man. A couple of days after when I asked him about the song, he said, dash it to him. I said, what do you mean why you dash it to him? He said, you say you don't like it, so I just dash it to him. So he called me in the morning and he, sing, he was singing the song, If I the band and they'd rule the world. But the song was so... Well structured, he just like, gave me a bounty killer vibes. So I said to him, say, you know I think Bounty should do this song. He said, so what do you mean by that? I said, yeah man, but he didn't like the idea. I could tell, okay. you know? But yeah. he didn't really come out and say it to me, say no. I guess he trusted my, my vision or my knowledge and just said, all right. So oh, we'll get this to Bounty. I said, don't worry yourself. I took him to the studio, did a demo. Went to the car wash all by myself. Come in over Bounty stay. Now Bounty's not a man you can just go car wash and walk up to like that. Mm. You, you're going to take you hours or probably days to get to talk to him. Because yeah. even though I met him before, I still can't just see Bounty and just walk up to him like that. You know? So I wouldn't take Cartel on that journey. You know, I had the time. So I go to the car wash and I would sit. Sometimes Bounty don't even turn up. And I had to leave, but... One day, eventually, he turned up and I gave him the cassette. It was actually two songs on the cassette that I gave him. So he took the cassette and said, OK, he's going to listen to it. So one morning now, just drop off my baby mother at work. She used to work at a Ministry of Labor. And when I was on East Queen Street going back to Portmore, my phone rang. I answered the phone, and the man said, but the war gone. I said, who this? He said, Bunty. I said, yeah, it's Bunty. Come off of my phone, man, about Bunty. I hung up. 
So the phone ring back again. I yeah. said, so yo, who this? What you want? Man said, but I'm to you. You can't believe that bounty killer call you. So that time I said, no, a bounty for true, because my phone never ring it on his bounty killer. Mm. He's always face to face with talk. And him say, yo, we listen to the tape now, me and God did a drive go over hell shop. And we listen to the cassette. Boy, bad man. Him say, when an artist good, him good, but are you telling him wicked? So I start, I tell you, even though I talk now, I feel it. Mm. I said, this feel good for your bounty, I praise my DJ them way I know. So bounty, I say, yeah, man, him bad man, we have to go do some work. I said, good. I go home and I tell the DJ. So the DJ admit, computer Paul, way before he met me, he threw a guy named Les. That Les is an engineer. So Les used to work over Computer Paul studio too. Uh, Les live in Waterford. So Carter let me meet um, Computer Paul. Computer Paul had a rhythm. So we make Computer Paul know, say, you know, say, okay, I'm probably get killed off a vice for the rhythm. So because me want to bust Carter, you know, Computer Paul say, any of you make kill a vice? I got boss cartel. I'm sure you know Computer Paul did the card right with him. Mm -hmm. So me have him as a big producer, so me believed in him. Me not think him go sell me no girl, you know? Yes. So we talked to Killer and Killer was kinda reluctant, but when you think about it, Computer Paul is a good producer. So I remember it was a Sunday we went to Anchor Studio. I recorded that song for Computer Paul, but Computer Paul never did nothing much for the song. So Killer got vice it over for jammies them. So after that now, that's how Killer now and Cartel start doing songs. Cartel start writing songs. Killer hear more songs with Cartel and I just saw the history start with, with Cartel, Cartel and Bounty Killer Cartel Bounty Killer thing. But now introduced me to Bounty and he took the CD and the next day he was like, yo, you with your body in a rare. And from that, you know what I mean? It's like a overnight change okay. completely. Read overnight, I first me I see it. So that's why I say, no business like show business still, you see me? Yeah. And where were you when they separated? Uh, I wasn't in the picture at the time. So I don't, I can't even speak on why or how or whatever, you know? Yes. I don't know what transpired in that time for them to follow, but I mean, if it was up to me, that would never happen because until this day, I'm still grateful to Bounty. Okay, if it wasn't for Bounty, we don't know where we would be right now. What caused you to be out of the picture? The answer to that question after the break and still to come. Vice Cartel's true strength is war. I wasn't in the fight, but they came at me to take away my license firearm. What would you have done when the war escalated? To a point where now, you know, fans were getting involved. On stage is brought to you in part by Dream Weekend in New York, August 27 to 29. For tickets and info, visit dreamwknydny.com. We out of the picture. Well, it's a, a collection of things. You know, you know, artists when they get established and uh, fame and a lot of things, but it was more so of a misunderstanding between me and him, monetarily, why I walked away. He, he, he got misinformed about um, a payment that I got from a promoter in England, but he never asked me about it. He assumed because the figure that the promoter told him that he gave me the promoter wasn't lying, but all of that money wasn't for him because at the time I brought Cash Money Sound and Singer J with me to England. So it was really three artists because after a while I was managing Cash Money Sound and Singer J. So I brought all three with me. So the money that he gave me was for all three. Okay. But Cartel heard the figure, thought all of that was for him. So he was looking at what the promoter told him and what I told him that I charged. And the breakdown there, and he went and he told Roach and it just cost. I didn't feel good. Because mm -hmm. I never even liked Roach either. So the fact that I tell Roach and Roach I run with it, 
it is just I just get into my feelings and my ego and all of that. I just walk away. So it, it wasn't nothing other than just a misunderstanding between me and him. So he had changed from you to Roach by then? Well, after that, I'd, Roach was always Roach. Just a dude in the street where Cartel can actually do anything, and he would run and do it. We, were, we didn't get along, put it that way. So when, when he heard it, I guess it was a joy for him to start you know, spreading the propaganda. So I just decided to walk. I just never called a cartel phone and he just didn't call mine. Hmm. It took us six months before we spoke after that. Yes? So who, who broke the, the ice, so to speak? Well, you know, it was me because I was living at the U.S. Embassy on Oxford Road in New Kingston. So I was driving out one day and cartel and a bunch of guys came out there to go put in their petition. So when I saw all of them, uh, while I was driving out, I pull up and I said to him, what are you doing here? And he said, you know, it's a petition we come put in. And I said, all I want So he said, what do you mean? I said, you don't need all I want to put in a petition. I just need one man to bring it up. So he said, you know, you used to do them thing. I'm going to know it goes. I'm going to think I saw. And I said, all right, give it to him. He'll do it for you. And that's how I didn't talk back after six months. Mm. But by then, me already tell myself, say, you know, that was it. That was it for music? For me. Okay, so you went on to do more work in, in music? I tried to do one artist after that. It never worked. Mm -hmm. And I just took a break and I came to the US. What year was this? 2005. 2005, you departed Jamaica. And music, your whole new life. Whole new life. All right, so we can touch, we can touch on that later on. But so now, what would you consider to be your biggest contribution to the rise of Vibes Cartel in that period that you worked with him? Okay, in the beginning, a lot of producers didn't want to record him because they were like, they can't understand. Is it true my style is mad? When I come up as a young artist and I go up in the studio, I turn on them places. The producer, they the big man, never want to vice me because that style is new to them. Because he speaks so fast. And the clarity is not there. So on the stage show that I get him on, he would be doing good. Because, you know, stage show is different from recording. Yes. So I said, what am I going to do? So I tell myself, all right, I'm going to start producing it myself. Mm -hmm. But I got into producing not to make money, but just to get cartel on the radio. So I would pay someone to make the beat for me, and then I would tell him, record ear-friendly music, music that they, they, they won't um, object to. So I did a couple of songs with him, a couple of collaborations also, get them on the radar playing, so at least he was on the radar. And then, you know, Jam 2 and Baby G, Jammy's sons, they were producing him also. But it wasn't until um, he started recording for Dan Carleone when it really happened for him in 2003. Okay. So you had no hit success in your producing? No, not in my producing, no. Okay. It As was just okay productions, but no hit. What credit do you take for setting him up to, be, to become the cartel that we now know? Well... I would give the, 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 the introduction to Bounty mm -hmm. because that was like a big platform for him to get that breakthrough. Yes. I mean, the, 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 the industry is running daily with him to um, stage shows and studios. You know, I helped put him out there like that. Because I, I, people, I'll give you an example. Jerry D that used to work on the radio. Mm -hmm. You know, he used to do his Saturday program live yes. sometimes. So I wanted to get Vice Cartel on one of those. So I went to Jerry. He said, um, okay, he's going to give him um, a try on the show. Mm -hmm. So 
the day in, in mention, Jerry D didn't meet Cartel before. Yes. So when they took the break, he came to me and said, okay, once we come back on, now we're going to call up, you know, Cartel. So when he said, next on stage, vibes Cartel, Cartel start walking up. Mm -hmm. So he stopped him. I said, no, I'm calling me. So I said, no, man, it's him. He's the artist. And Jerry said, oh, because I was <laughs> camping in the street so much. Yeah. I used to DJ his lyrics to artists and to producers just to get them to know him and also mm -hmm. to record him. Mm -hmm. So with, by camping him so much for him, people used to think I'm the artist. Mm -hmm. Or think I am an artist. Yes. So they didn't really know him then. And then he never used to go in the street like I used to, to studios. He would mostly stay in Waterford. So you know, our regular artists would more be at the studio every day trying to look the rhythms, the record. I used to do that for him because yes. he never wanted to leave Waterford. So I'm the one who really took him out of Portmore, bring him to Kingston, mm -hmm. where he could meet those people. And then in 2000 and, in 2000 and 2001, I came overseas to work on a program. So I left my brother in charge of Cartel. So during that two year period, that's how he met some of the top um, selectors to like Fire Links and Renaissance, Jazzy, Jazzy T and those guys. So, and then my brother met Sharon Burke and introduced Cartel to Sharon Burke also during that period. Cause Sharon met my brother before she knew me. So, it was a collection of um, the, the road work, the footwork that I did and introducing him to. So you, you're taking credits for setting the foundation? Oh, definitely, mm -hmm. definitely. But not 100%. Yes. Because I have to share the credit with Cash Money Sound because Scratchy B used to make a lot of CDs and put out with Vibes Cartel, like just Vibes Cartel only. Even when no one knew about Vibes Cartel, until it helped to propel the cash money sound into prominence. Because now everybody going after a, vi um, a Vibes Cartel CD from cash money sound. Okay. Because it's, it's, a, it's a, a sound system from Portmore. Yes. That, um, Cartel used to just go there and record for Scratchy B. And songs that people don't even know, Scratchy B would play it, even if you're not moving in the party. Okay. He's playing it because he also believed in vibes. So that was the underground promotion. Exactly. When lots of us didn't know him yet. No, nothing. That was going on in the hardcore street. Yes. And also Cassette Jones. He used to sell cassettes um, in Crossroad. You know, those guys who would go record the parties and come back and sell the tapes and stuff. He also used to make his own compilation of cartel songs. Okay. Plus, when we used to go to the stage shows, I used to go to him and I said, put like 20 songs on a CD for me. And he would burn them, give me like 100, 200 CDs. So when I go to the parties, I throw them in the crowd because that's how I used to promote cartel. Okay, so you, so you, you were intricately involved in his underground promotion as well as above ground, meaning mainstream radio and television. W wasn't it you who brought him to us for an interview? For interview, yes. His very first interview and on stage, you were the man managing him. Yes. And I also give credit, I can't stop. I mean, no disrespect to DJ Wayne. DJ Wayne is like the icing on the cake. Yes. But Digital Chris from IRFM, the first time I met him and told him about Cartel, he was like 100% receptive. So I share the credits with them. But of course, you know, Bone Tequila is the real, that was the icebreaker right there. Once he met Bounty, it was, it was all over. Like, like, like the song says, Butler introduced me to Bounty and the rest is history, no joke. And still to come, what did you think of the breakup with Bounty? No matter what they do, it can't come back. I just walk away. When Shata go to jail, I think they took offense to that song too. From there, I think that's when they were like after him.
Honestly, I could not control it. On Stage is brought to you in part by Golden Crust Caribbean Restaurant. Savor the flavor of Jamaica for breakfast, lunch, or dinner. Visit goldencrust.com to order for pickup or delivery now. What did you think of the breakup with Bounty? If I should be honest, I wasn't pleased. Because this is me. Um, if, if you have done something good for me, I will always be grateful. And I'm not saying Cartel wasn't or isn't, but he would look at it different from me because he's an artist. Yes. His aim is to be the best. You understand? So he's not going to think the way I do. That is why artists have managers because managers should be um, level-headed where you don't let emotions and all that get in the way to, for you now to go take side and mess up your artist. You should be able to say, you know what, you, you might be in the right, but this can damage you. Don't do that. So I didn't like the fact that they, they had that follow, but thank be to God, they are good now. But some will say that the breakaway from Bounty Killer was the, when Cartel started his exponential rise, when he was now on his own and found the deeper him artistically. Some will say that. What do you say? I wouldn't agree. You know why? In my head, Carter was so talented, that would not stop him. Because it's not like Bounty would say, you can't record that song or don't record that song. Bounty Killer is not going to stop him from recording. So he would still do his recordings. Maybe the break away may um, show him up more because when he started the clashing, people will see the real talent. Because a lot of people don't know that Vice Cartel's true strength is war lyrics. Mm -hmm. That's his true strength. You, you try to war with him, trust me, you're going to see how talented he really is. Yes, witty, quick. Terrible. So when he went to Dan Carleone and he did Sweet to the Belly and he saw the reaction that he got, he realized that I can't do girl something, you know. But his true strength was war lyrics. So what do you think? What did the trick for him? Is it, as you call it, girl songs or war? The girl songs gave him the breakthrough to me. But let me tell you, man, sometimes they say what I've bad, make good. Yes. The breakup with Bounty Killer was probably the, 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 the patch for him to show how bad he is as an artist lyrically. So he because, was inspired. Right. Maybe he would have ended up warring with another artist. Because remember, he, he had a little, a little minute war with Spraga Benz and an assassin, mm -hmm. you know, which didn't go anywhere, really and truly. But with the Movado and the cartel now, because Movado feeding into it, cartel feeding into it, that went. And sometimes the business need that. Yes. Because it helped both of them financially. Would you have supported that? The Gully Gaza War. To an extent, I would say yes, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't support it for it to get to the level that it got to. You understand? Because at the end of the day, my father, and even until now, is still a friend of mine. He, he's not gonna see me and pass me. You understand? We still have respect for each other. Bounty Killer is the same. Bounty came to Atlanta to perform. I think it was 2008 or nine. And he saw me, and at the time, young Cartel was deep in their, their beef, and he never showed me no bad face. He spoke to me like nothing. What would you have done when the war escalated to a point where now, you know, fans were getting involved? Well, Winfred, you have to understand this. You know? I can't even sit here and tell you that, you know, because sometimes the clash is bigger than you, the manager, you know? Yes. Because when an artist is up at 2 or 3 in the morning at a studio recording. You're not there. You don't know what he's doing. A lot of his recordings, I'm not there. You understand? And I can't try to be everywhere he is, because yeah. I'm not his producer. 
I'm not, I, I did not sign him as a producer. I signed him as a manager to manage him. So when he's doing his recording, sometimes I'm not there. So, so those lyrics are already going to be out there, and I can't pull it back. Yeah, but would you have walked away if you were still part of his management, his production team too, at that point, when it had escalated out of control, so to speak? Well, if I'm talking to him about the danger of what he's doing, and he's not listening, and I see where it can affect me, then the possibility, yes, I would, because then I would realize that he's looking for him. Mm -hmm. I have to look for me. Because even with Sting, 2003, the Ninja Man saga, yes. I had a license firearm. I wasn't in the fight, but they came at me to take away my license firearm oh, just yeah. because of my affiliation with the artist. But when they did their investigation, they realized that I did nothing wrong to, with mines. Yes. So they okay. gave it back to me. So I realized how some things can affect me if, you know, or how deep I am in it. What, were those things, that for example, part of the consideration for you too? No, man, this thing, this thing, thing, I didn't support what happened. Actually, after this thing that same morning, yes. I went to Ninja Man's hotel room mm -hmm. and talked to him and apologized to him. Because oh, did? I didn't support. Yeah, he's, at the time, Ninja Man didn't even know who I was. And when I introduced myself to him, he turned to his friend, because there were a lot of guys there from all about. And he turned to them and he said, this man brave, we don't know who this is. And he told them. But then he sat and had a conversation with me. And I lived to see Ninja Man came to Atlanta in 2006 and was in my house. <laughs> Cartel's conviction, what went through your mind when that happened? The answer to that question after the break and still to come. When Shatter got jail, I think they took offense to that song too. From there, I think that's when they were like after him. On stage with Winford Williams, so much more than entertainment. Let's talk a little bit now about Cartel's conviction and incarceration. What went through your mind when that happened? All right, you know, I'm not pleased with what had happened in all honesty, because of what I heard. Remember, I don't know about the case. Yes. Because I can only speak of what it's is said in court, right, in the court and what I hear. So a lot of it in my head, I believe it's a target. But that's just my belief. You mean people targeting Carter? I think the system was at him. The system? After mm -hmm. The legal ever system? Since legal, ever since Sting, I believe the system. Because what happened at Sting should not have happened. And a lot of them were upset okay. because of it. And then when he sung the song that says, mm, when Shatter got jail, I think they took offense to that song too. Okay. Yeah, so... From there, I think that's when they were like after him, just waiting for him to slip up. Could you have made a difference in that? Any positive person could have if he would listen. Because the thing is, you know, he has to listen and is willing to listen and take advice. You understand? So you could, you could preach all you want. If somebody not interested in what you're saying, I don't care then you're not going to get the result. So telling him the right thing is one, mm -hmm. but it's up to him to really see what you're trying to say to him. And it's not like Cartel is not a, a young man that you can't talk to. He's someone that you can't talk to, but sometimes he has his beliefs, yes. and you can't knock him for it. 
What would you like to see happen for Cartel? Oh, definitely would love to see him come back on the street. Because at the end of the day, you know, he has a family that he loves dearly. He has a life to live. And I'm sure the time that he's where he's at now, he must look into a lot of things and see how he could have handled it differently. So I believe, I believe he, he, he should get another chance. Do you think he will? I'm hoping. The thing is, when the system is after you, it's hard. That's my belief. And not because I say this now, it means that that's how it really is. But just on my belief, I think the system was after him. Did he ever want you to come back and manage him, to be part of his management, his team? Yes, on two um, separate occasions. Um, in 2006 March, he did three shows um, in the US. One in Texas, one in Orlando, and one in Atlanta. So I went on the road with him for those three shows. It was him and um, Escobar, Megabantan, and um, Merciless. So I was on the road with him for those three shows. So after he, he left <clears throat> to Jamaica, he texted me saying that he would like me to come back to be his manager. Yes. But for the same reason what I've said earlier, like the system, because I, I was hearing that from people in the system, that they didn't like his behavior at Sting. So I knew. So I said to him, turn yourself into the police and clear your name. I guess he didn't like that, or he didn't want to hear that. But six months later, he was on Ari with, or one of those stations with Mark Shields and Movado. And I was like, that's what I was telling you to do six months ago. You know, so. The peace truce that was right, called just that. To, it, you see, yeah. the police can say what they think, what they hear, and also what they know. But until you go and face them sometimes, you never know what's going on. So he, had he had done that, then yes, if, if he had listened to me and said, you know what, I would go, but I want you to be there when I'm going. And then in June 2009, it was actually June the 3rd, I had a long conversation with him over an hour on the phone. And he said to me, Butler, really need a manager. He said, business is going good. He said, the closest thing I have met since you left is Corey. That's Corey Todd. But Corey's still not good like you. I need a manager. And I said the same thing to him. I said, you're, a, you're joking. I have too much yes man around you. Which he admitted. He said, yeah, it's true. So you would have gone back had he cleared himself he, of? Those things that I said to him was for him to convince me that he's a different person and he would listen to me. Because honestly, I could not control him okay and i realized that because even if you tell me yes he's still gonna do i mean example so you understand i book shows overseas for cartel and when the day come for for us to go on the plane cartel is nowhere to be found i remember when i was at the embassy men came at the embassy well i told him where i live i wasn't hiding Yes. Because we didn't go to their show in the US and they wanted back their money. So I told them where, where I was for them to come and get it. And I remember one of the men said to me, you know why we're not going to do anything? You didn't hide. Mm -hmm. You were so cooperative because they were so pissed. So I went through a lot of that where we collected money. He didn't go to the shows. For why? Why didn't he? Winfred, I can't answer that one. <laughs> he has his reasons, I don't know why. Sometimes we double booked. I book a show for him, he book one for himself. So we had those clashes. So the frustration was building up. 
So that is, you know, it just lead up to me just being like, I have to start thinking about me. So what kept you silent for so long? You have not been out there claiming, as do so many who helped his, 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 his rise. Because I'm not that type of person. People will hear the name, but they don't know the face. Did that have anything to do with you staying away from music for so long? Staying away from the music was a choice of mine because if I could make my name worldwide with the affiliation of Vice Cartel, why would I take up someone who is going to be less? A lot of artists um, contact me until this day. In my head, if I can't find another talent on the same level, as cartel are better, it makes no sense for me because that's like I'm going backward. Yeah, I'm a bit excited right now because of um, my nephew, King Zidi. K X N G underscore Z I D I I. That's his in Instagram name. He has like almost 80,000 followers on Instagram and over a million on TikTok. And um, if he decides to take music seriously, I'm excited for him because I'm also going to be a part of that journey. Right now, he's the person I see that could take me back to music. Oh, wow. You are in business now. You're a businessman in the United States now. Are you comfortable with, with your life now? I'm happy to an extent, yes, in my life right now. If there were things that I could have changed, maybe. But like I said, it's for a reason why it happened. Because like the Bible says, before I was born, God already know my journey. Family, kids? Yes, I have three kids. Um, I have a fiance right now, a girlfriend. I'm not married right now. Yes, but three kids. Three kids. You care about how people will react to this interview? No, not really, because you have to understand, you know, the people from day one who knew Vibes Cartel before he became Vibes Cartel and who knows me, they are going to say that there goes the truth. Because a lot of guys out there talking all this nonsense about them and their part that they played in Vice Cartels, um, stardom. And I just laugh when I hear them. Some people, I, I remember I was in a party here in, in Atlanta. And this, this guy, um, Billy Slaughter from Stone Love was playing. And this guy, when Billy Slaughter mentioned my name, this guy went up to him and said, no, Butler did not bust Cartel, it's John FX. And I'm like, John FX came in the picture after me. But because he knew Janifex, he contacted Janifex, and Janifex had to tell him, like, ah, that's the man right here for real. Because I know Janifex in person, so he called me and he told me about it. That the dude contacted him the next day, and he had to tell him, no, man, that man that you say you saw in the club, that's him for real. Butler, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Appreciate this chat, sir. Very frank. A lot we've learned. And um, I can't thank you enough for, for sitting with us and spending so much time relating your story to us. And let us know about the kid and let us know when you're ready to come back to music. All right, so there you have him right here on our stage in Atlanta, Georgia. Vibes Cartel's first manager. And that's our show for this week, Winford Williams, on behalf of all of us. Thanking you for joining us. Do join us again next week for more on stage. Thanks for watching our video. Please click subscribe and be on our stage anywhere, anytime, always.